Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Breath of Fire 2. Last episode, our Jean got into a cooking competition with the imposter Jean to prove his culinary skills, and to that end, we fought a really, really offensive fly. And now, we want to be prepared for our next battle, so... Get nine vitamins, get at least two wisdom seeds, um, I bought nine wisdom seeds just because I had the money to. And also, you only need nine smoke bombs, because an, an item called the Holy Scarf is going to obsolete them completely. But I didn't know that at the time I made this walkthrough, so I bought 18 smoke bombs instead. So, just get nine of them. Keep that in mind. Right. <sighs> So, today is going to be a bit of a less active episode, because there is quite a bit of dialogue. If you got any questions, now is the time to ask. Well, I was told that there would be a lot of exposition in this episode, so... Not really even exposition, just a lot of talking. Although there is one minor detail at 144 that I'd like to point out, and... Also, more sprinkled throughout, so that's good. But yeah, basically all that happens in terms of gameplay is I fight a boss, and I get some items, and that all doesn't happen until like 9 minutes in, so if you want to skip, you could. Anyways, do you see how the imposter is having his food carted out? Right. And watch how Jean has to prepare his dishes. He has to do it all by himself. Yeah, and he had to do it more slowly as well, so... Already you can see the bias playing out right here. That and the fact that he had chefs helping him. Also comes one of the game's funniest lines from our Jean. See, he doesn't want his kingdom back. He just wants to spare the imposter the burden of being Patape's brother. He feels a little bad for him, actually. <laughs> I came a little out of the blue. Well, it's a joke. The two are comedic foils to each other. Jean is the airheaded vagabond that always shirks responsibility, and the princess is the exact opposite, the compulsive nag. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I think it makes sense of this now. So I think that because because this character that we are we have this arc going on, I think he's a temporary character. I think he's just going to end up returning to his kingdom in the end. So, and that's why he's not very good in combat? Yeah, because he's not supposed to be. You're not supposed to use him. So he would just return, right? That makes sense. Yep, makes sense. So, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I feel like... When you have a lot of dialogue in a game like this, you really need a fast forward button. Especially since there's a debug menu in this game, and in one of them is something called Kaiwa Speed Up. If you turn it on, the text boxes just advance as fast as they possibly can on their own without you needing to hit a button. The only time they stop is when there's a yes and no prompt. So the functionality is already in there, probably just for testing purposes. So that's a big opportunity for a quality of life feature for players, don't you think? Sure, and how do you go about activating this speed up? Well, I like the way this one game called Zone of the Ender's Fist of Mars did it. You just hold down the R button, and it's activated for as long as you're holding it down. And then when you're not, the text goes back to being normal. Right, but is it something that's already programmed, or do you have to like use a cheat to bring up the, the menu on that? Yes, you have to use a cheat to bring up the menu. Right. Well, regardless of that, I think it's a, it's a pretty big deal, I'd say, since this game has a lot of dialogue. Yeah. And, to be fair, if you're a writer, 
and you're writing a story, you do want your dialogue to be read, right? Just like you're making a Pokemon hack right now, and if you're gonna design a thousand trainers, you want your player to at least fight most of them. You've said that before, right? Absolutely. That's the whole point of it. It's to see people enjoy it, right? Yeah. So from that perspective, you wouldn't want people speeding through your dialogue, right? Well, I guess it depends on how much effort was put into it, right? Because the more effort you put into the dialogue, then the more I would imagine you would want people to read it and such. Yeah. That said, I think at least in the post-game, or once you've beaten the game at least once, you should get that functionality, if not at the very start. I would actually advocate at the very start, just because ultimately you're not creating a game for yourself. You're creating a game for the consumer, so... <laughs> DANG! It's dramatic for something like this. Indeed. Uh-oh. The head chef looks guilty or something. It looks like the chef was pressured into just saying what the, the prince wanted, right? The imposter. Yeah. Which is also the reason why the king and the queen are up on the balcony and not actually tasting the dishes themselves. There's supposed to be three judges, but only the head chef is actually tasting them. I found that strange too, that only one of them is doing that. In any case, about the text, if they want to speed through the dialogue and experience your game in the way they want to rather than how you want them to, that is their right. But it would also make sense that you just let it be a post-game thing too that you do on repeated playthroughs. Which would you lean towards, Skyzo? Well, I think that in this case, the function is already there. So some people just like to enjoy the combat and they don't care much for the story. So I don't see the harm in, yeah, leave it up to the player. I also kind of like the way Golden Sun... Why did the music change back? Yes, the music changed. Why? Keep the track going! Like... Okay, yeah, the head chef just basically confirmed he was pressured by bringing up his wife and kids, but still, what happened? To the music? I don't know, like, the transition was even kind of buggy. <laughs> like, there was no fade out or anything, it just cut out immediately. That happens in a few places, actually. And the Game Boy Advance version actually fixed all of those instances to where the dramatic music just plays out completely until you leave this room. Like, it would still be playing here as Patape is freaking out and saying, Well, she'll do something about this. Yeah, it looks like somebody messed up an instruction on the music. Yeah, that happens. Well, this game's really buggy, so... It's a shame that it cut out the way it did, and that it doesn't play more often. For example, I would have had it playing at Sky Tower, but we got to hear it, so... Anyways, it looks like the competition is over, and... Honestly, the head chef is really broken up about this, but to be honest, what else could he do? I mean... Jean doesn't care about the throne at all, so he's gone. The king is... out of it. And Patape apparently wasn't able to stop the imposter from taking over, so maybe she just doesn't have the power, so... Realistically, what other choice does the chef have but to bend over? Well, he has none because he doesn't have the power, right? If he was somebody more important, like an advisor to the imposter, then I could see that working. Well, even so, though, you need to be confident that the guy you're fighting for will actually take advantage of your sacrifice. Didn't seem like Topeda would. 
Anyways, here is where we finally get some action. So, let's put Ryu in the back, because this guy has some really powerful attacks. Not quite as bad as the Wildcat, because this one can at least be negated by really good armor. Which means this fight becomes a lot simpler if you did everything I mentioned in the bonus episode, but even still, you want to be careful. You know, I didn't think we'd fight him. You didn't? Nope, I didn't think we'd fight him. I thought he'd be like a wrestler or something. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Me, I think he's clever, ruthless, and smart enough to be a recurring villain, but he dies here. So, notice his emphasis on quick, because among other things, this guy always, always goes first. He literally has 65,535 vigor every time he attacks, so you're just not outspeeding him. Also, there are three phases to this fight, and he gets more aggressive in phase two. But the worst thing is that if you reduce him to 50% HP or below 25%, he will actually interrupt the fight and end the turn early. He can do that twice, so we want to make sure that we damage him in such a way that he only gets to do it once. So you want to hit him with three Ice Whelps, which do 512 damage per shot. And we want to do anywhere from 114 to 213 incidental damage. Under, and we won't get the uh, phase skip. Over, and he'll interrupt us early. So how you play is the difference between a 4 turn fight and a 5 turn fight. And yeah, there's Shimmy. That's basically a regular melee attack that hits everyone. And his last attack is something called Wee or Ha, depending on the translation, and it's a melee attack that does triple damage. And there's the phase interruption there, but yeah, the Ha attack is the one we're really afraid of. The less of those we get, the better. Uh, uh oh. Oof, down goes Cat. Fortunately, we have an Ammonia on hand, so hopefully we'll be able to revive her and get some EXP for her. Anyways, we are about to finish him off. Let's see if we can revive Cat while we're at it. And Ryu has enough HP right now to where Ha won't kill him, so we've got this fight in the bag. Didn't seem very difficult, although this does seem like one of those bosses where if you make just one mistake, it'll be impossible to beat him without dying. Yeah, that's the main thing, like, it's not that you'll lose, it's just you can't really guarantee that no one dies unless you got all that super OP armor, but that's not too big of a deal. Right. Also, fun fact about that fight, in Phase 1, he has over a 50% chance of doing a normal attack, and only a 12% chance of attacking all of us, and a 25% chance of using a strong attack. But once he gets down to Phase 2, he'll use a lot less physical attacks, do a lot more shimmies, and even do some more strong attacks. So, the main thing, though, is that there was actually supposed to be a third phase to that fight, where he gets the ability to use an instant death spell, he gets the chance to inflict zombie on everyone, and he gets the chance to land a curse on you, which will reduce your condition. However, this does not happen due to bad assembly instructions. Basically, Phase 1 is assigned to zero, 0, Phase 2 is assigned to 6, which is a positive number, but Phase 3 is assigned to 128, or negative 1. And the instructions they used only work for positive and 0 numbers. It does not work correctly for negative numbers, so the third phase ends up getting skipped entirely. 
Not that it would matter, because we would still one-shot him with an Ice Whelp before he even got to that phase, since you'd have to reduce him below 412 HP in order to see it, but still, it's a neat little detail that you unfortunately don't get to see, him getting progressively more aggressive. I wonder if there's a patch to fix something like that, because it seems fairly simple to do. As far as I know, the Game Boy Advance version might even fix it. I mean, there's quite a few other bug fixes in that version, so I definitely want to try it out sometime. Perhaps, but I was thinking of something fan-made. No idea. If anyone would be the guy to do it, though, it's Juchan. He's mainly the main speedrunner for Breath of Fire 2, and we've me and Nitrodon have kind of been sharing all our info with him. Actually, he's been a huge help in the making of this LP, because, at least for the very first part, my route was heavily inspired by him. With the needed modifications and all that, to sacrifice a teensy bit of speed for more safety, since this is a walkthrough, not a speedrun, but I digress. Also, that there is the Saw Blade. It is a holy elemental sword, and also the strongest one we have at this point. Holy elemental weapons are really good because they are the only thing that can do decent damage to spirit-type enemies. Enemies that otherwise resist all attacks by half. So even once we get a better weapon, we still want to keep it around. Interesting. Sounds like a very good weapon. Indeed it is. Yeah, like I said, the old king is senile. <laughs> now then, Skyzo, I have a question for you. If you were to cut out pieces of this subplot, which cutscenes would you keep and which would you discard? Well, I don't know much about this game in terms of the, the story of it, so... I would have to I would have to analyze the cutscene. If it's important to the plot, then you don't want to discard it, obviously. I don't want to see about that. Me personally, what I'd probably do is one, I would make sure that you struck a deal with Patape so that she mentions that she has Patty in her basement and you would get her as a reward for helping Jean take back his kingdom. Or at the very least, I would have her put in prison because with her being the way she is, the obvious question is, how did the imposter ever get as far as he did when she would have been opposing him? I mean, there's literally no one else. The king is senile, the people probably know that. And Jean is... they never know where he is, so in effect she should be the one running the kingdom. So, who was running the show before the imposter showed up? So a good hand-wavy explanation for that would be that he just used magic of some sort. Oh, and... By the way, there was a Zenny chest that I missed in the last episode. Forgot to get, so... Let me fix that right now. Anyways, what were you saying about the imposter and brainwashing magic and all that? So, he did transform into a, a demon, right? You'd think he would have something like that. And there are bits he here where the king is being unusually lucid, as Patape said, and is supporting the imposter. I think the game sort of leaves that vague to whether or not he was actually under a spell, or whether or not he was just senile. I can see why they would leave it vague, because you don't want to think about it like that. I feel like it's a cop-out explanation. It's not very satisfying. Plus, you get sort of a joke where the king says, Ha ha! Clearly he used a spell on me! I would recognize my own son in a heartbeat! And Patape's like, Uh, Pops, turn around, he's right there. Anyways, there it is. We can finally clear Bosch's name and go back to hometown. 
Nice, finally, we've been at this for like a while now, so I wonder what will happen next. Alright, before we go, the fake prince built an armory and we are about to raid it. Most importantly is the breath armor, which I think is supposed to be blessed armor, but for some reason even Ryu Sui didn't catch that one. Basically, it's holy elemental armor, which means it protects against all status ailments. Or darn near all of them, at any rate. Like, for example, the weaken or defense down spell won't work at all. And it's also one of the lightest pieces of armor you will ever see. Like, I think it's equivalent to the ranger's suit. So, Sten especially really likes it, because... He tends to be in that area where he's just a fast enough that he can sometimes outspeed, but also slow enough to where it's not a sure thing. And Lean also likes it just for being a good solid piece of armor that won't slow her down too much. So make sure you get that. And then there's the Royal Crown, which is one of the only decent pieces of headwear that Princess Nina can use. Prince Tapeta could also use it, but, well, he stinks. And for those of you who've seen this backtracking in the bonus episode, I wanted to show it again just for those who don't watch those episodes, because they're bonuses. They aren't the main walkthrough. Right. Well, I think it would be funny, though, since the player is expected to... Well, I guess not expected, but it's entirely possible that the player will just abandon Tepeda because it's so... it's not very good, so... It'd be funny if he just returned to the castle. I think that makes sense. Indeed. Well, that would be the end of this episode. All in all, what did you think about this part of the game? Well, I thought it was odd that they included the the plot point of the rug castle thing, but we did get some important items, so... Well, I felt it wasn't a complete waste of time because there was some interesting, I don't know, some interesting battles, right? Interesting things to talk about, so I enjoyed it. Yeah. Anyways, anything else you wanted to talk about, Skyzo? Not really. I think this is a good game in general, overall, even though the developers were on crunch time, right? So, it's pretty good. Yeah. Anyways, I think that will be the end of our recording right there. This has been Fiona Day Questers, signing out. Have a nice day, everyone, and God bless you. I'll see you later, YouTube. Bye.